Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people. This grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through him in, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. And this is the word of the Lord. Uh, Let me pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that by reading it we can know you and your plan for your people in the world. We pray that today as we look more closely at this passage that you would be working in us by your spirit to make us what you want us to be to make us more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Don't be on the wrong side of history. Don't be on the wrong side of history. It is a phrase that lately we are hearing more and more frequently. Uh, It suggests that one's moral or social beliefs will be judged as in the wrong by future generations. That in, say, 50 years' time, the majority of people will look back at certain practices and beliefs with a mixture of shame and disgust. In much the same way, we look back with shame and disgust at issues like slavery, child labour and gender inequality. Uh, Barack Obama declared Russia to be on the wrong side of history over their treatment of Ukraine. The Mayor of London... Uh, Sadiq Khan argued recently that allowing Donald Trump to visit London would put Britain on the wrong side of history. Meat eaters are on the wrong side of history, according to a seemingly growing number of vegans who believe it is inevitable that humans will give up the practice in the future, and I hope in the very distant future. To declare someone or something to be on the wrong side of history is an almost arrogant assertion of moral superiority. It is a confident statement of I'm right and you are terribly wrong. It's used in disagreements about all sorts of issues. As Christians, we are frequently being told by non-believers that we are on the wrong side of history with regard to a range of current social issues. 
Some argue that the recent law changes around marriage and abortion are proof that all things religious will soon be relegated to our more ignorant past. Uh, Reading through the comments of online news articles, we can see Christians and Christianity described as outdated, backwards, dumb, infantile, dangerous, and the list goes on. I don't know about you, but reading and hearing things like this so often gets me down, disheartened. The incessant assault on the validity of the Bible at times can lead me to question, is it true? Are they right and I am wrong? This sort of disheartening attack is nothing new to Christians. In Acts 19, we read about Paul's time in Ephesus and his teaching caused a riot when he was there amongst those who worshipped Artemis. The local Christians, after Paul left, would have been marginalised, derided. They would have felt pressure from family and friends. Why do you eat with Jews? Or how dare you spend time with Gentiles? Why don't you worship the great Artemis? And now, to top it all off, seven years after he left, we read in verse 1 that the one who brought them the gospel is now in prison. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. Were the others right? Is Paul's imprisonment confirmation that the Christians in Ephesus were on the wrong side of history and that they should just give it all up. Well, in verse 1, Paul is actually beginning a prayer for the Ephesians but gets sidetracked before picking the prayer up again in verse 14 and you'll have to wait till next week to hear that one. The reason for his diversion is because of the craziness, the wonder of what he utters in verse 1. Yes, he is in prison, but the remarkable thing is that he is in prison with a job to do by the will of Jesus and for the sake of the Gentiles. Paul, a Jew, who according to Jewish custom is forbidden to even enter the house of a Gentile, is in prison for them. And it is not because he is on the wrong side of history, but because of God's wonderful plan. Uh, Now, it may seem odd that Paul asks the Ephesians if they have heard about the job that God gave him on the road to Damascus, as it was Paul himself who evangelised them and helped to plant the church there. But seven years have passed since he was in Ephesus, Uh, So he doesn't want to assume that any new members of a church there know what his job is, who he is, and why he is willing, happy to go to prison for the Gentiles. Because by knowing these things, by understanding who Paul is, Gentiles like us can understand how significant we are. Look with me at verses 2 and 3. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. Paul has a job. Well, so do I. But as we read in Acts 9, what sets his job apart from the rest is that his job was given to him directly by Jesus who also equipped him, gave him everything he needed, gave him grace to carry the name of Jesus the Messiah before the Gentiles, to bring Gentiles into God's family or household under the headship and administration of Jesus that we heard about earlier in Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2. And at the heart of this job of Paul's, there is a mystery. This mystery is not like an Agatha Christie or Wilkie Collins who-done-it type, 
where there was a crime committed that can be solved by a very clever person. Rather, this mystery is something that has always been operating but must be revealed by God. It is mentioned back in Ephesians 1, verses 9 to 10. God's mystery is his plan for everyone to have Jesus as their boss. The mystery of God's plan was previously unknown, but God revealed it to Paul and the other apostles who in turn were to make it known to the world through their preaching and their writing. Look at verses 4 and 5. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. So what is at the heart of the mystery? Well, Paul reveals it to us in verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel... The Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I admit that as a Gentile Christian who grew up being taught the good news that through faith in Jesus and all all he has achieved in his life, death and resurrection, I have eternal life and access to God the Father the significance of this revelation is somewhat dulled. But for the Ephesians, Gentiles and Jews, this mystery would have been staggering. Jews and Gentiles, forever enemies, seemingly irreconcilable, are equal in Christ Jesus? They are together heirs, one body, Together, sharing in the promise? It's unheard of. In Jesus, the promise of God to Abraham to bless the world, both Jew and Gentile, is completely fulfilled. In Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the chosen anointed king, God's promise to King David of an eternal ruler and administrator of God's family from his line is fulfilled completely in an entirely unexpected way. The Gentiles who enter in and through Jesus are equal members, not second-class citizens in the renewed nation of Israel, but heirs, family. Paul goes on to say that this job is not one that he asked for or wanted. Remember that when he received it on the road to Damascus, he was going to kill Christians Um, Nevertheless, God chose him and equipped him to do the job of immeasurable value and joy that he did not deserve. Now look at verse 7. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Did you notice that once Paul received this job, God did not neglect him? It is God's power, that very same power that raised Jesus from the dead, which now moves and strengthens Paul in this job, despite the fact that he is currently in prison for doing that job. So what is Paul doing? Well, he is just doing his job, working in and for the household of God so that Gentiles can know of their equal share. And the job is made up of two things. Look with me at verses 8 and 9. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Did you catch the two parts of Paul's job? to preach and to make plain. He is to preach or to proclaim, that is, he is to tell the Gentiles that they can now be part of God's family, that they can know God personally, that they can have life at the moment they are dead, that they can have equal membership in God's people. He is also to make plain or to shed light on this plan of God. That is, he is to help the Gentiles to understand that this has always been God's plan, 
From before the beginning of time, God had set his heart in making a people, a family group for himself and for the whole world to know that Jesus is king. Now, what is the significance of this job? What is the point or purpose? Why does God want this job to be done? We find the answer to that in verse 10. His intent, God's intent, was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This is a remarkable and astounding verse. Listen to it again. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Paul does all this so that the church can display to the world how wise God is. Uh, Let's look at this a little more deeply because this is the climax of what Paul is doing. The church is a name given to the gathering of God's people in one place, at one time. Church, in this sense, is primarily about who Christians are, not what they do. It is a statement about their identity. They are God's mob who God gathers together to meet with him and each other. When this mob gathers, there is something about them that declares the wisdom of God that God is wise beyond our comprehension. Why is that? What is it about that, about this gathering, that declares that God is wise? Well, look about you. Cast your mind out to those around the world we call brothers and sisters. Where else in the world would you have such a diverse gathering of people? What else brings such a mob together except something that God has done? Uh, Let's think about it another way. If they trust that Jesus has died for their sins and if they have repented, turned back to God, and if they rely upon God's grace, then church includes people of all different racial backgrounds, people of different social standing, thieves, murderers, from the vilest offender to the most self-righteous Pharisee who truly believes. When this mob gathers, they display God's wisdom because God himself has done something to bring them into existence. God did this in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. In the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, there is in one moment the perfect display of perfect mercy and perfect justice. In the one event, God completely and justly judges all sin and at the very same moment, God extends perfect mercy to the very people whose sins he has just forgiven. Only God is wise enough to achieve that. And the church, all these diverse people, equally saved by trusting in Jesus, meeting as God's mob, is the display of and proclamation of this wisdom. So when the church meets, it proclaims to the world and especially to the devil, that ruler who we see in chapter 6, the one who our struggle is really against, the one who sends that unrelenting assault that makes us question whether or not we are on the right side of history. When the church meets, it proclaims to the world and the devil that God is wise. Look at what he has achieved. This has always been God's plan. Now look at verse 11. According to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus has achieved it for God and we are the display of it to the world. Well, Paul returns to his plight in verse 13. 
I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. As the Ephesian Christians hear of Paul's plight, their natural reaction might have been discouragement, even guilt. After all, Paul is there because of them, he says. This is not how Paul addresses his situation, though. Instead, he regards it as a moment of rejoicing. His imprisonment is for their glory. It is a function of them being regarded as significant. That is really what glory means. Paul's imprisonment is for their growth as significant. Do you get discouraged at times, like I do, when bombarded with people in the flesh and in the media telling you that, you, that your beliefs are stupid, backwards, dangerous, and on the wrong side of history? Do not be discouraged. If you are connected to Jesus, then here today you are part of God's display of his wisdom to the world, both spiritual and physical. That is significant. Yes, perhaps in 50 years' time, people will look back at what we believe with disgust. Yes, individually, we will make mistakes. Yes, corporately as a church, we will get it wrong. But if we are connected to Jesus, the beginning and the end, the one before whom people from every tribe and nation will together bow and sing and praise, then ultimately and eternally, we are on the right side of history. And what are we doing here at Narrabri Anglican Church as we wait for that day when the church will meet perfectly for the first time? The Ephesians were the product of Paul doing his job. This letter was shared around the churches of that region and they were reminded of the same truth. In fact, as we read it today, we are products of Paul doing his job. After all, aren't we all Gentiles who now know the incalculable riches in Jesus Christ? Now, sometimes we scratch our heads at Paul and wonder, what was he doing? Well, by God's grace, he was doing his job. And that is a wonderful thing. We have benefited immeasurably. But Paul's faithful work should also pose us a question. What are we doing? You see, his job had a purpose. Let me read verse 10 again. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Imagine, as we meet, that there are a whole number of people from Narrabri at the windows and doors watching us. It's a bit creepy. Uh, what do they see? Do they see the proclamation in the gathering of this family that God is wise beyond our understanding? Or from another angle, what do your friends and family think of church as you talk to them about it? Do they catch from your joy in gathering as God's people that this is the most significant, most wonderful, most eternal and long-lasting thing happening in the world today? You see, the purpose of our gathering is to declare the wisdom of God. But we can perhaps sharpen the question some more. I think that I can ask myself, as a Gentile brought into God's people, what am I doing? And we don't mean to encourage you at this time to think about good deeds that need to be done or morality that needs to be stressed. Instead, I want us to each think of how we view our time together as God's people. As we, as we gather, do I view this as an expression of who we are that then feeds into each of our lives in the week? Or do we view it as an event to tick off? As we gather, do I view this as an identity to enjoy or an event to endure. As we gather, do I thank God that he has decided that these are the people to display his wisdom in Narrabri? 
Or do I complain about what is lacking? As we gather, do I give thanks that I am, by God's grace, involved in one of the most significant moments in history? Paul, imprisoned for the sake of people like us, delighted in such a moment because it helped create the significance of God's mob in Ephesus. Do we delight in being significant? Are we significant in Narrabri because of God's work through Jesus proclaimed by Paul?